Welcome to the Stuart Crazy Podcast. This is episode two, uh, where we are going to be talking largely about medical equipment, uh, doctors, the medical industry, and it uh, doesn't take much to stay relevant when you're a museum that deals with a lot of history. Uh, you know, I know medicine is on a lot of people's minds, and uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today. I am here with uh, co-host Rob Nelson. Hello. And uh, Rob is one of our curators here at the museum. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of a stroll through some uh, outdated equipment. Is that a, a good way to put it? The equipment that people, medical equipment that people thought worked once upon a time and now has been uh, has been proven not to be quite as effective. That's correct. Uh, I, I would just say that it, it, it was it was. Uh medical equipment that just kind of came at the at, at the beginning of, of modern of modern science and uh, while it was it was cutting edge at the turn of the 20th century or maybe even a little bit before you know we've made innovations on top of innovations and uh, now here we are in the early 21st century and we were lucky enough to have an exhibit last summer that dealt largely with this very topic so we were coming off a year where you you know our curatorial team really, worked hard on this, you know, very narrow fo focus of history, which I think is pretty cool. Absolutely. We had a, we had an exhibit last summer that got a lot of, you know, a lot of great praise from the community that, that focused on all kinds of different forms of medicine, dentistry, optometry, um, homeopathic care, even, even uh, medicine from World War I was, was a focus during this exhibit. And uh, today I'm, I'm going to be talking with uh, Carrie Stouffer, who's our head curator here, as well as Sam Stump, who's our curatorial technician, about that exhibit and uh, our favorite artifacts from it and just, you know, how important all of those artifacts were to, you know, medicine in the early part of the 20th century and, and even before that. Man, and there are some doozies. I mean, if you, were, if you were a fan of early medicine and just the, how do I want to put it, just, just some of the things that people believed back then, some of the misguided things that may have led to things that would, you know, become medicine as we know it right now, uh, you're going to want to hear this conversation. So should we jump right into it? Let's do it. Hello, everyone. Here again for episode two of the podcast. It's going to be centered around the topic of the doctor's office. We have a fully functioning 1890s living history museum here in Grand Isle, Nebraska called Railroad Town, and it has a doctor's office inside of it. And uh, our curatorial staff is here today. I'm a member of that. My name's Rob Nelson. Uh, Carrie Stouffer, who is our head curator, is also here. Hello. And as well as Sam Stump, who's our curatorial technician. Hello. And uh, we were fortunate enough last summer to do an exhibit that kind of that featured 19th century, early 20th century medicine. And so we thought there would be nobody who would be a better expert to kind of talk through, you know, some of the, the artifacts that we that we encountered and uh, how they kind of tie into the topic of 1890s, early 20th century medicine. So that much further ado, I think we'll just go ahead and dive right in and start, right. start talking about them. Is there anything that anyone's jonesing to talk about right off the top? Well, I think there's probably a couple different ones. Sam, you want to start off? Oh, I, I suppose I can. Um, I mean, one thing that we that I, I just really enjoyed putting that exhibit together. It was a fun, fantastic exhibit to do, and it featured so many different areas of medical profession, um, from dentistry to homeopathic medicine to um, what they would have done during wartime. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's and it's very interesting that they all kind of had a, a general feel of um, of antiquated medicine, and yet that was also kind of the top of their game right. um, at the time that it was. So it's it was very interesting to put together. Mm -hmm. I know the dentistry was extremely um, shocking. I'm very happy to live uh, when I do. There was a child's dentist chair that where the arms folded in and strap the child down so that they couldn't move. Very, very glad that uh, wasn't my memory. <laughs> With yeah. very little comfort, too. There was no cushioning involved in the chair. It was uh, just pieces just of metal. steel, yep. I feel. Oh, that hard, were... cold metal chair. Yes. <laughs> and there was also a drill involved in the dental part of the exhibit that had a foot pump that 
was very, very <laughs> jarring to look at. Uh, it was several feet in diameter and weighed upwards of 50 pounds. <laughs> yep. And uh, the drill itself was about the size of a Sharpie. So just imagine that going into your mouth <laughs> while a dentist hammers away at a foot pedal beneath you and his arm and his heart rate's going as he just right. makes that drill. <laughs> you hope he doesn't get a cramp. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it, it, it's important to, to, to mention, I think, that you know, the purpose of this exhibit wasn't to say, oh, wow, that was so crazy. They were quacks and didn't know anything. You know, it, they did the best they could, and at the time it was, it was top-of-the-line, cutting-edge medicine, and they thought themselves you know, much better off than even a, like a generation before that. So, um, Well, absolutely. I mean, and really, um, you know, when dentistry was being handled by, you know, we've talked about before, barbers and such like that. And then, you know, so this was a step up. And I guess we can only imagine what uh, it will be like, you know, in another hundred years. Right. And, it, you know, at the that time, too, we are starting to look at how they were um, – just at the beginning stages of having any sort of real anesthesia, too. So it wasn't the best, um, and if you overdid it, it could definitely knock you out permanently. But it, it was, was definitely available, though. Available, yeah. <laughs> well, just like just like today, we 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 employ medical practices that aren't necessarily proven to be effective. They did the same thing in the 1890s and early 1900s as well. I know, Sam, you wanted, you wanted to talk about the, a potato. Why would we be talking about a, a piece of potato today with regard to medicine? So the potato that we have in our collection, it's um, a tiny piece of a worn-down, dried-out potato. <laughs> and it was given to uh, Dr. Gear uh, by a patient of his who had claimed, swore up and down that it was a cure for his rheumatism. He kept it in his pocket with him. It He would rub it with his thumb. It built up a patina even. And he just kept it with him at all times. And he said, you know, better than any other medicine, that was what cured his rheumatism. Yeah, and so then it found our way into our collection. Yeah, <laughs> it was part of the donation that was given by the Dr. Gear estate. Yeah. And he was a Grand Island physician. Yeah, he yep. was a Grand Island physician. And, and I think that's wonderful because when we talk about the different things like we do in Railroad Town and how we interpret the doctor's office, you know, things like that and magnets and potatoes and things, all sorts of things like that were cures. Mm -hmm. um, and we had examples of those in our exhibit along with, you know, electrotherapy and all sorts of things that, you know, that we have similar things like that today too, mm -hmm. that people try out. And I know magnet ne necklaces exist and different stones and crystals. And Do we have anything else in our collection besides the potato that people carried around with them in similar ways? Um, yeah, they, they actually did already have some magnets back then as well that um, were said to be cures for rheumatism, muscle aches, all kinds of different ailments that, you know, you wouldn't think carrying something in your pocket would be the solution for that, but they really believed that it worked. And for some people, it the results showed well enough for them. Yeah. You know, whether it was just the placebo effect um, coming through or whether it had any real merit, who knows? Right. Well, I mean, there are lots of things like that that, that also would have led to more serious things. You know, there, mm -hmm. we've also talked about the bloodletting and, you know, different things that um, people thought about that would make them healthy, um, like draining some blood or doing things like that. But that mm -hmm. led to either more research. Um, and then I know, Rob, there's an interesting blood diagnosis kit that you're interested in. Yeah. Uh, the, the period that we really focused on in this exhibit was kind of, I think, a, a crossroads between where science sort of got its, its jump off point. Like before there was, you know, sort of this, a good way to think about it is how like there was a, there was no division between astronomy and astrology up until right. a certain point. And then as science really developed, there was a distinct line that kind of diverged between those two fields. And it kind of happened the same way with 
mysticism and science in, in medicine up until, you know, around, I would say the start of the 20th century, late 19th century, you kind of have these beliefs about medicine that weren't actually true, but they were kind of based on popular myth and family stories right. about mm -hmm. what, you know, throwing garlic at something would cure it or... Right, the spirits know, and the, the evil spirits yeah, and or, or witches and... Spraying Windex on a wound or, you know, right. like in Big Fat Greek <laughs> Wedding even or something like that. But um, <laughs> at, the, at this point, though, in the early 20th century, I think you start seeing the, the beginnings of real medical instruments that began to have tangible benefits and could be measured as such. Um, and one of those that we had out was a, um, a blood, an early blood sugar test, which uh, determined the sugar in the, in the urine for diabetic patients. You know, today they have those cutting edge things that are, you know, in, in just like a few seconds or a couple of minutes, you're, you're done and you, oh, yeah. you know what it's your blood a, sugar is. A quick little drop of blood or I don't need, I think sometimes they can do it even without taking blood now. Yeah. But in this case, you know, it's, it was an elaborate sort of at home the, the the item that we exhibited, it was a box that had an eyedropper in it. It was a it was a, a test tube with this uh, Lister test solution inside of it. Um, you had to go into your bathroom and have a, a urine sample. Like it was a pretty elaborate task that had to be performed in order for you to find out what your what your blood sugar was. You know why that might have taken time and it would have been inconvenient. It still was a a tangible tool that people benefited from, finally, uh, scientifically, I think. Yeah, and then led to all the furthering of that tool down the road to where mm -hmm. we're at now. And exactly. Then, yeah. And, you know, the same thing with, uh, we have what, in the exhibit, uh, it was called a hemocytometer, which uh, measured the red and white blood cells, I believe, in, uh, in the body. And it came with this little book that had a, a chart that, that mapped out each individual palette of color of, that blood might have been, starting with a very pale yellow that was almost white, and it just increasingly went up in little splot, like splotches of squares uh -huh. or whatever. Mm -hmm. They went from that pale yellow like all the way samples. up to dark red. <laughs> yeah, they can get it at Home Depot. Exactly, <laughs> yep. and you would, um, you know, you would draw your own blood and compare your color of blood next to these, you know, paint palette colors essentially. And that's how you determined, or that's how doctors used to uh, diagnose anemia or even leukemia at this mm -hmm. time. And I mean, within that, the actual booklet that we have, we actually have samples of somebody's blood in there where they were testing it. Oh, really? Yeah. They, yeah. yeah, there are these little tear away sheets. Yep. So you could put your blood on it one day and see what color it was, tear it away, throw it away, and then there's another sheet for the next day. Yeah, but there's some actual blood dots yeah, in that somebody book. somebody throw their sheet away. Right. See, and, and these two have been around the museum a lot longer than me, so they know those little uh, tricks of the trade. I haven't, uh, that's something that I didn't even know, and I, you know, but I digress. Um, are there other uh, instruments you two would like to, to talk about today? Um, I, you know, I always think of the, uh, the Lubenswecker. Oh, yes. Um, as one of my all-time favorite pieces that we pulled for that because it's just such an unusual looking instrument. Um, it is like a, uh, a rod where the top screws off and there are pins underneath it. And what you would end up doing with it was you would poke yourself with those pins on the end and then you would rub like an oleum cream. And what it was believed to do was bring out infection um, in that area okay. and cause pain in the area you poked yourself with rather than the pain that you were actually feeling. And what it would just create was pus-filled boils yeah. <laughs> caused by the oleum cream yeah. rather than drawing well, out infection you know if you have a toothache and you give yourself a big boil on your arm you know the toothache's You're not gonna not feel gonna the tooth so much anymore yeah <laughs> i think that's so. you know wise wisdom from our grandmothers or something right and i think that was you know kind of the takeaway from a lot of the medicines uh that were coming out was that they you know if they caused pain in a different area you weren't gonna <laughs> feel the pain in your foot anymore or a lot of them contained a very high content of alcohol, so it would just numb everything. Right, right. And, and I think that this instrument in particular, when it caused those boils, it was believed that somehow the infection 
would come from the other part of yeah. the body and make its way into the boils. Right. So when the, those blisters popped, the infection would just magically leave <laughs> yeah. the body and you'd be cured. It seems simple enough, I think. Seems simple enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, believe it or not, though, it was pretty... But, you know, it may have, it may have some logic. Um, it was popular for exactly. a really long time. Um, yeah. And it kind of goes along with the bloodletting. And it kind of, you know, I'm not going to say that it was an early um, form of, like, cupping or anything. But, you know, there are other ideas that you can draw out your energy or your illness yeah. or something out of your body. So I think everything has a little bit of um, of legitimacy mm -hmm. to it that's exciting to see and then to see how it progresses into the... Uh, yeah, and, and Sam was talking about the placebo effect as well. If, if you believe you're going to be cured by something... yeah then maybe you will be, you know, there's, it's a real phenomena, the placebo effect. So mm -hmm. um, even if this, you know, an, an instrument like the Lubenzwecker doesn't necessarily have the backing of science, that isn't to say that people didn't feel, I'm not going to say they felt good after using it because oftentimes <laughs> a lot of people felt sicker after using it. So I am not endorsing the Lubenzwecker, right. but Don't there were, there were some people, yeah, <laughs> there were some people who, who felt better after using it. Uh, they might have been the high minority, uh, right. or, a, or very sorry, a very low minority of people, but they were out there, I guess. Well, and I think that's what's exciting. We're going to talk to um, Ben Kistler a little bit later, and he's going to talk about um, how he portrays uh, medicine in Railroad Town and talks about the kind of people that would have visited and, and things that they would have wanted. Because that was the other thing is that I think early patients were very um, demanding <laughs> of... Uh, doctors and letting them know what uh, what they thought would work yeah so and that's going to come up in segment two of the podcast is our our interview with uh ben who plays the railroad town doctor as, a, as an interpreter as the, the town doctor uh, that kind of segues us into talking more about our own doctor's office in particular the building itself in railroad town is modeled on a home of two prominent physicians that were in the Hall County community. Um, Carrie and Sam, I don't know which one, maybe you want to talk about who they were and what their contributions were to the area? Well, they were the deaf and boss, yep. but go ahead, Sam. Uh, they, yeah. Um, so what we're interpreting in Railroad Town is kind of a... A family, a couple yeah, of doctors, a couple which of is really exciting. doctors, and what their office might have been set up like. So, um, and we are focusing on the Deffenbaugh's. And Nellie Deffenbaugh was the superintendent at the uh, tuberculosis hospital in Kearney um, for a number of years. But both her and her husband worked as homeopathic doctors as well. Yeah, they both had their doctor's degree and, and mm -hmm. were physicians here in Grand Island. And we were fortunate that they were still around. Um, I think they opened their office in 1907, but we were fortunate enough that they were still around in the beginnings, the talkings of Stewart Museum, and yeah. donated all of their office furniture, which was really a household furniture at that time because you worked right. out of your house, to the Stewart Museum. And so we, we have a lot of their furniture, their desks, um, I, I think a couch, and some other things that are in the doctor's office is all part of an actual doctor's office from Grand Island. Yeah. Some of our listeners might not be familiar with what homeopathic medicine means. Uh, Sam or Carrie, do you want to delve into maybe what a good working definition might be for the layman of homeopathic medicine? Homeopathic medicine typically uses more natural cures um, or reliefs for ailments, uh, such as... Um, herbs and spices from your garden and as well as other kind of plants that you can get a hold of like aloe vera um, is a great homeopathic medicine and it does it does help with burns yeah. and um, it soothes pain so yeah well and I think what's interesting is that um, people may not know to, may not know that uh, regular physicians back in the 1890s or this era, were also homeopaths, so they 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 put those two things together. They weren't one or the other, mm -hmm. um, and so um, you had a lot of focus on science in one area. But then, you know, right outside the doctor's home, they would have a homeopathic garden, 
um, and bring those things in, and that's what they'd make their medicine out of. You know, your doctor would be your pharmacist. Your doctor um, would be doing um, your exercise routines. They would be looking at your whole health um, as a physician in the early 90s, uh, 1890s. Yeah. I know we, uh, we, we mentioned the death and boss. Just in my own research, I know that Nellie was at the tuberculosis hospital as a superintendent uh, in the early 1900s. Um, tuberculosis was a huge, huge health crisis and epidemic for decades in this country. Uh, it was known as the White Plague in kind of reference to the Black Plague of the 14th century. That, that's sure. kind of how serious it was. That's a pretty important job in 1907. Um, how common was it for someone like a, a woman to be the, the head of a major hospital like that in the early part of the century? Yeah, I don't have any ready statistics, but obviously it was not common. Sure. Um, not common at all. It was it was hard for um, some women to make it through, you know, school, especially out here in the Midwest, because, you you know, you wouldn't be able to just go down the road to medical school. You'd be going to Chicago or Philadelphia um, or some places like that, and you'd have to spend your time in your residency there um, and then come all the way back out here. Um, and so... The chance that you'd get just get caught in normal life while you were out there getting your degree would hamper some women from coming back to the Midwest. Um, but even on that, you know, when you look back at classes, there's only possibly two or three women that are in classes that are 60 or 70 men strong. Exactly. Well, that's about all I... <laughs> that's all the questions I had. Um, we're going to transition now and talk to our resident doctor of railroad town his name is ben kistler and we're going to ask him more about what life would have been like for an 1890s physician and in, in kind of uh the rules of his trade and how he he operated so hang with us and we'll be back in a minute today's podcast is brought to you by william siebler blacksmithing and horseshoeing plows sharpened at reasonable rates a dealer in farm and spring wagons. R.L. DAC agent has over 30 years of active experience in the trade. All repairing promptly attended to. Satisfaction given in all his work. Your patronage is solicited. Again, at William Siebler Blacksmithing and Horseshoeing. All right, we are here with uh, Ben Kistler, who is a uh, interpreter in Railroad Town. Railroad Town, of course, is our 1890s living history community. It's where we interpret the uh, uh, this year. It's 1890 in Railroad Town, and uh, Mr. Kistler is our is our town physician. Is that about right? Yes, sir. I'm um, Dr. Deffenbach's assistant. Dr. Deffenbach um, had to go. Him and his wife went to North Platte, and um, I, me and my wife have taken over for him because there's an outbreak of measles there. And um, so we're hopefully he'll be back, but you know how it is. It takes a while to get there with horse, and it takes a while to get back. And Absolutely. So yes, I am the local doctor. Well, we have a few questions we'd just like to ask you to get a feel for what it is you do and uh, how you do it. Okay. Let's start with the, the garden outside of the doctor's office in, uh -huh. in, in Railroad Town. Um, percentage of what you do has to do with homeopathic treatment and a lot of the ingredients you get for that treatment are found in that garden. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that and uh, um, how that works? During that time, a lot of the medicines, you had to raise them yourself because you didn't always have someone to get them to you. But um, on the other hand, there were, you know, there's like the local Indian that would come through that would gra gather different things and bring them to you and trade for them. Um, some of them we would raise ourselves. Um, and some of the things people don't realize how they're, um, they can be used for so many things. It's like, um, for instance, um, we, we do a lot of grinding of the vegetables. And it's like in the pharmacy or the doctor's office, I have a mortar and pestle and I grind wheat. And um, I let the kids do it and they just love to do that. Sure. And um, and sometimes I do, mainly I do oatmeal, and they want to eat the oatmeal. And, of course, we can't, but, hey, 
it gets them excited about it, and they let them try, and so that's fun. But some of the things, mm. rhubarb. Yeah, we perfect. have rhubarb, and most people think it's it's not really an important thing, but it's um, it can be used for a lot of things. Um, the leaves are very toxic, and so people don't realize that. And here they've raised it in their backyard for years, and that was one thing. Guess what we did with it? We use it for a cleanser, you know, to maybe it had a, a certain area of the barn or house that needed to be cleansed, and it would kill anything. You know, and of course alcohol did the same thing too, which we got from the local bar. The rhubarb, the stem, of course we we eat that. We make rhubarb pie, and I always joke about my rhubarb pie. So we raise lots of that. And um, the roots is for another thing. Bear with me, I forgot what we do with that. Um, but every single thing we have out there has different uses. Sure. Some are real common, and some aren't. And so. How, uh, you mentioned like using those as, as, as prescriptions. How, how would you go about um, making sure that you have the right ingredients on hand for, for various ailments? Would, would that, did that work itself out fairly easily or did you have well, to send away for stuff? And... You could try to get some things. Um, Kansas City was a place where a lot of people would get things from. So was Omaha. And like I said, the local Indian man, um, Indian would come through, and he might be a, a medicine man in his tribe, and he'd make the way around the state, and he'd stop in, and he'd have something to trade. And, of course, you'd have to trade something back. You know, um, it might be something valuable. It might not be. Sure. But to him, it was. So, like, let, walk me through the process. If I, was a, if I was a patient of yours in the 1890s, and I, I was in railroad town, and I needed help, and just say I was very ill with an unknown you know, mm-hmm. sickness. What would that process look like, I guess? Where would you treat the patient in the home? Because it's, you know, it's okay. a, it's a, it's it a private a residence. And if you were kind of visual like this, a small two-bedroom house with the kitchen, and in the basement of the kitchen is a cellar, and that's where we would keep some of the things to keep them cold. Back in that time, you couldn't keep, like, beef down there because animals would break in through the foundation and swipe your beef, but you could do canned stuff. So a lot of the things we had were putting glass jars and canned, just like some what they do nowadays, only a little bit different. Say you come to my house, it made a big difference whether you come to the, in the middle of the night or when. Or um, if you look, if you came from just looking at the house, there's a porch on the back. And that is basically the entrance that I used for people to come. You come to the porch, there'd be a little space. We could wash you down. The well was out, you know, behind there. We could take a tub. We had a big tub, you know, and we had to give you a bath. Sometimes they were just so dirty, just cleaning them up made a big difference. So you might do that on the porch. Then you bring them into the kitchen and then into the dining room. The dining room may not seem like much, but there's a famous book out there, and I don't remember the person that wrote it. But on the front cover, it shows the picture of a doctor, and on his and on his dining room table, yes, his dining room table, that's where he did his surgery. Wow! And the reason they did a lot there is, you got to remember, he may not have had just one person; he might have had a family come in and they were sick, and he might have broken a leg or something. Had to work on it right away. They were in the dining room on top of the table, and. Um, he would sit down on a chair next to them, and that's where they would do that. In the office, which was off of there a little bit, that's where we would see patients if they weren't very sick. If you're familiar with the house at all, it has multiple doors. Every room has an extra door. So you can go in the back door, go through the kitchen, into the bedroom, and into the office, and nobody knows you're there. Wow. They treat you, and then if it wasn't something they didn't want to have everybody know about or whatever, you could walk out the front door. If not, you could sneak out the back door. What were, uh, what were some of the most common illnesses or, or injuries that... Common you, illnesses or injuries? At the time. A lot of times, because we worked with horses in those days. Oh, sure. And draft horses are pretty big. In fact, they're, you know, a couple tons. In fact, the pair of horses that was one of the men visiting, 
he had a pair that were 22 and 23 hands, which is about yep. as big as the draft horse can be. And um, someone had stepped on his foot many years ago. For those of you, sorry, for those of you not familiar with how they measure horses, they oh. they use them with hands, which is essentially a, if you if you can imagine just putting one hand on top of the other one until you reach the, is it the, the shoulder of the horse? The shoulder of the exactly. horse. Exactly. Yes. Sorry, go ahead. And then you figure more feet up above. Exactly. Um, they uh, they would get stepped on by a horse, and that was real common. In fact, you could break break a leg or a horse. Or, for instance, like my dad many years ago, farmed with horses, got drugged a half a mile by his team of horses before he could get them to stop, and he messed up his leg pretty good. And sometimes it can be life-threatening, too. Sure. And so we have to first figure out what's going on and what is the most important thing to treat. Besides that, there's illnesses like they might get um, poison ivy they might and poison sumac, and there's a lot of different poison flowers and deals out there. So you'd have to eliminate all these different things before you went to your cupboard and, hey, I think I, this guy's just playing me. I'll just give him some placebo. Sure. Placebo was something we did a lot in those days. And there's something the local um, person would come through and um, you could buy stuff off his wagon and he would be the local, he'd have the, you know, Dr. Whitmore's famous cure for everything. Yeah, the, the miracle cures, the, the miracle wizard cures. oils. and well, A lot of those guys, they would come into town and the first stop they would make is the local bar. They'd have their bottles that they had saved. They'd go to the local bar and they'd ask for the cheapest whiskey that they had. He'd go home, fill up his bills, <laughs> go out and open up the side of the wagon and he'd start pitching his the cheap whiskey snake oil. He wouldn't tell him it's whiskey. Sure. <laughs> he would say it's Dr. Jo- Dr. John's or Dr. Deffenbach's horse There you go. Tournament. And a lot of times it would cure a lot of things, and he would cure, you know. And then um, he'd send, sell a bunch of it, send them home, and then the next day he'd get some more before he <laughs> opened up. But this time he'd make it a little bit stronger. And the reason they made it stronger is because Let's say you went home and you weren't, you didn't seem to work like you wanted. Well, if you give them three shots of whiskey and now it's going to be six such shots of whiskey in that regimen, it's going to be more potent and yeah. it'll be a relaxant or help them to sleep or maybe it even might put them out. So it's like the first bottle was good, the second bottle's even better yet. And sometimes you do it because they come back and say it didn't work. So that's the way some of those work. But far as in the doctor's office, we'd use different weeds and, you know, something like an onion. Sometimes you would use those. Sometimes a lot of these things we would raise are just food to help people get more nourished. And one thing was to, you know, make sure they had plenty of water and things like this. You could, you could treat anything you wanted. Sure. Um, you may not have never done it before, you know, it's like, and a big thing back in those days, unfortunately, is we had to amputate. Amputate was, if all else failed, you could amputate a part. And a lot of the books I've read at the uh, doctor's office were telling about how rough the instruments were they used. And so you might have a foot that's gone gangrened, and the only way you're going to save it in those days is to cut it off. Save the life, yeah. What? Save the life, yeah. Save the life. And they did that a lot. And the better you were at cutting it off and bandaging it up and getting them on the way, the more popular you were because but a lot of times that was the big thing that they did in those days, amputation. It wasn't a fun thing. And yes, guess where they did it? Right on the li- dining, dining room, room table. table <laughs> in the living room. Um. The other thing we had in that office, which most people don't realize is we had pot belly stoves. Pot belly stoves, we'd boil water, um, and the water would be maybe to put a, a rag on their head to cut down the fever if they had fever. Um, it was also the doctor's office was to quarantine people. That's something they did in those days. Maybe you might come in with measles, and you might come in with a bad foot. You might come in with eye trouble. We could put you in different parts of the doctor's office so you would not 
give whatever that you had to somebody else. So, so how did the doctors protect themselves then? I imagine that was a challenge. Well, that, was, that wasn't too hard. It was a matter of a lot of luck and a bunch of prayers. Yeah. <laughs> Basically what they did is alcohol. They also were one of the prime subscribers at the local bar. They would get a bottle of alcohol, and if you look on the, a lot of the bottles on the shelves were alcohol, and they would use it to clean down the area. They would also use it to clean themselves with, but the best thing was to go out to the well, fill it up with water, and shoot, you know, wash yourself wash down. Wash it all down, yeah. And they used a lot of the old tubs. I don't know if you remember seeing any of those. We did have some medicines that were actually good for certain things. Were they going to work? It was just hit and miss. Because you didn't always diagnose the right thing. There was like um, one drug. It's, it's a drug from, it was uh, white, white bark. White, um, I can't think of the name. But it's a white bark from a tree. And it was real famous. And back in 18... I think it's 1885 or somewhere around there. It got, they used this mark and they were able to put it in a bottle. And guess what? That little bottle, it was the first selling of aspirin. Oh. And so we started selling aspirin in a little bottle of 30 pills all around the country. And it started, that white willow bark is the tree. Um, Some of the Indians from up north and around the country were using it to reduce fever and hmm. pain. And so they would bring it in to like my office and generally the back door and he'd say, hey, what you got to trade? And we would, hopefully I could speak enough Sioux or whatever language it was at the time. The main thing was he would show this and he'd tell me what it would do. You know, in his language it might be fever, it might be pain, whatever. He'd come up with something and hopefully I got the right thing. But yeah. I saw it enough that you would sooner or later start to buy it. And um, you hope you could find a white willow bark tree, but you couldn't always. And so you would get that. The other good place to get my medicines was Grandma Kistler. Grandma Kistler made all sorts of remedies, and she could cure everything. And this is a true story. My real grandma was the dentist in her part of over by Shelton and Wood River, and she had all these regimens she could treat stuff with. And so you would hope there would be a lot of people like her that were, it was generally an elderly person in the community, generally had a large family. They'd drop by and they'd say, hey, you know, what are you treating for this? And you'd recommend what you had and she'd recommend what she had. And that's how you got a lot of these old time remedies and hopefully you got something good. Sometimes you would buy them. Um, Some of the bottles in the doctor's office were actually bought in medicines and a lot of times in those days they used a thing, it was a little box about this big, about this, and about like this. And there would be medicine in there you could buy and you, you basically knew what it was or hope you did and you could treat your patients and so what I would do is let's say for instance you come into the doctor's office and you're complaining of fever or whatever, and I didn't have any, my favorite drug, but I might have something else. So I'd give you what is known as the powder paper. And what they do is, we had a little piece of paper about that big, and we would pour some powder in it, fold it over, fold it again, put it in a little dinky envelope like that, seal it, and we'd tell you, we'd write on it how many times a day to take it. And it might be, take one packet with water, three days in a row, and that's what we give you for your medicine. And that was an early variation of, before they had pill makers that could compress that into a a, a, a pill, they used something along those lines. I kind of want to move along to to payment. I mean, you you mentioned buying a lot of these things from, you know, local travelers, whoever they were. How how would you collect payment from your, your community members, it, okay. were, was that always available to so them? It just turned out, Dr. Deffenbach, um, he was one of the first members of the Hall County Medical Society. And him and about five of his cohorts come up with a regimen how much to charge. And I don't remember, but the list is on the back door of the doctor's office. And it's, if you're in the kitchen, on the left-hand side before you go in the living room, there it is. I would try to tell people about this when they come in so they had some idea what the charge was going to be. 
and some of the things were in dollar form. And that was generally the way at that time, some kind of money. But the, probably the biggest thing uh, doctors and people would deal in those days was, for instance, um, you'd come to me and you didn't have anything. But you might have two chickens exactly. ready to eat. So I'd take the two chickens, butcher them out back, and guess what? They'd go down, I'd eat those. I might have one today, one tomorrow. They might even go next door to trade with the boarding house because they need a chicken to, for their borders. And so that's how we would... Call it square. a lot of barter, bartering between yeah. person and person. What a... You mentioned a little a, while, a little while back it would it depended on what time of day uh, that yeah. some, that someone would arrive, the kind of treatment they would get. Was a... Was a doctor's office like this open 24 hours a day, or well, what, what were some of those differences? This. Me and my wife lived in the one bedroom, and we didn't have you generally come in the front door, but on the side door, and that's where the um, um, porch was. And the reason we'd have you come in there at night, because this way we could, you're a little off the main street, we could treat you, you'd come in, you'd go into the kitchen, and then you'd go into the dining room, and we'd treat you there. And uh, we do that at night. It's more of a, probably a, just a good precaution so nobody come through the front door to rob you. Sure. But it was a good way of, you know, seeing people. If it was during the day, you could come in the front door or knock on the front door, come in and go to the living room. And we'd say, we'd kind of take a quick look and we'd move you next door to the door right there. And that's into the exam room. In the exam room, I have a nice desk that's very practical. It has mailboxes. Um, it has little drawers where I can put more medicine. It has uh, places for pill bottles. And, and there's a good chair there so I can sit you in it and I can do the examination there. Absolutely. There was no table to examine you. You just basically sat in a chair and we did everything at that point. But we did that during the day. But generally at night, we would come in the back door. You know, a lot of uh, the ins and outs of what you did on a daily basis, it, was the education required of a doctor something that would be similar to today, or would it have been something that was learned in a, in a sort of apprenticeship style, like just working on the job and learning those kinds of things as there you went? Both. Both? Um, you got to remember, there was a lot of quacks in those days. Oh, yeah. Uh, but one of the things... Grand Island at one time, I didn't realize it, and I found some one of the books, and there was a great big kind of a, I don't know if it was a university or something like a, a where they learn um, different kinds of things, and one of the doctors had taken classes there to become a doctor, but the classes he took had nothing to do with medicine. Yeah. And so when he graduated, he got a degree as a doctor, even though that's what he was going to be, this particular one that was telling us, writing this in this book. And so you may have learned, like, you might have learned some law, or you might have learned <laughs> that's <pertinent>. some history, <laughs> or you might have learned um, a big thing was how the country worked. You know, um, that was a big thing. And then you could go to, like, say, Kansas City and do some schooling. You could go to Chicago and do some schooling. You could go to a doctor if they would take you and work with them, generally free gratis till you got so far along, and then you'd come back. And then there were certain doctors, and I saw in one of the books that would go around. They might come to Grand Island and stop and spend a day or two, and you'd have to wine and dine them at the local bar and restaurant or whatever you had to feed them. Generally, just take care of them yourself. And they would teach you some of their things. In the doctor's office, there's a, it's kind of like a, a daily diary book that I found. And it was put out by one of the major drug companies. I don't remember who. I think it was Merck. But anyway, it was a diary, one a day. And on day one, you would start it. And it'd be, and it, I can't remember what year it started. But the neat thing about it, every day there was a disease and how to treat it. Oh, wow. And so when your patients would come in, you say, oh, I remember two months ago. Sure. On a certain day, I read something. And so you come back to your book, and there it was, how to treat, you know. Successful or not, though. Successful or not. And yeah. you tell what you did, 
because it may not be what you should have done. Sure. But you'd also treat, tell how it succeeded or failed. Whichever. Absolutely. Ben, I, ju I just have one more question for you. Yeah. Um, and it, it just kind of gets to the, you know, the importance of the doctor in the community. You know, as a, in a small town, a, a doctor would have gotten to know everyone f fairly well over the years, all the family members. You know, would that have been a, a burden or, or very tough for that person to kind of be responsible for the well-being of essentially their own family members yeah. in a way, if, if that makes sense? It was a tough thing because, unfortunately, there was a lot of diseases come through that, you know, all these people, you maybe delivered their babies, they moved into town, whatever. Exactly. All of a sudden you got a disease come through and it wipes out 10%, 20%, or maybe all of your population, but a few. And so it's it's psychologically, it was probably very hard on the doctors. And it's like you say, you felt a need to take care of them. And um, sometimes it was hard to do that because you're just... You know, there just wasn't enough time in the day, and you didn't know enough, and uh, you learned as you went. Yeah. I can only imagine. That just seems like such a, like an overwhelming burden to carry for, for someone in that situation. But, well, this was a really fun conversation. I'm glad you stopped by. Those are the, the questions that, that we had to ask of you, and uh, I think all of our listeners are going to really appreciate your, your insights. So well, I hope so. Well, they can, when we open back up, uh, they can come and visit you in Railroad Town. Well, I probably won't be there much, but I'll Probably not try. much this year, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll... There's always another year. There is. Well, thank you for taking the time. Thank you, Ben. That is going to do it for the second edition of the Stewart Crazy Podcast. Uh, we want to thank everybody for listening. We uh, very much would like your feedback. So if you head over to stewartmuseum.org, you can find all things Stewart Museum. Stewart is spelled S-T-U-H-R. And um, we're all over social media, so you can leave us a, a comment. Any place you can criticize podcasts, please let us know uh, how, you think, how you think we're doing. So, uh, Rob, what are, we, what are we looking at next week? Yes. Uh, next week, we are going to be talking with our resident tinsmith from Railroad Town. His name is Lauren Miller. He's a brilliant man. He knows all about that art form. I, I'm really looking forward to that conversation. Yeah, he's been, been the, the uh, Railroad Town tinsmith for a good number of years, so he'll have a lot of stories to tell, and can't wait to dive into it. So thank you again for listening, and we'll be back next week. Thank you. Thank you.